Hi everyone, I'm Alicia and I'm a grateful recovering sex and love addict. And this session is our Q&A session after the meeting. My roommate is my qualifier. How do I have no contact with them? And so it could be that your qualifier is your mother. It could be that your qualifier is your coworker and you're right near them in proximity. It could be that it's, you know, I've, I've had people who come to the program and their qualifier lives next door to them. So these are what I call require industrial strength, commercial grade working your program. And so you obviously cannot see them, but you have as little contact as possible. And I recommend that you work with other fellows to be able to say, you know, what would sobriety look like? And I like to call that step two, part two, is that step two is that we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves would restore us to sanity. So we believe in this higher power, but let's spend some time on what would sanity look like? Okay, if your qualifier is your roommate, what would sanity look like? It would probably look like attempting not to criticize them when they leave their dishes in the sink. It would probably look like not trying to, you know, maneuver them to get them to do what you need. It would maybe look like having as little contact as possible. And, uh, and then, but what's really important with these kinds of qualifiers, when they're coworkers, when they're um, neighbors, when they're roommates is being able to say, how can I get out of this situation? Like we're not stuck. No contact is claiming your power back. You know, like what would it look like if I cl was claiming my power back and how do I get on with a peaceful life? You know, my real flagship qualifier was my mom. And, you know, I pretty much had 25 years of predominantly no contact with her. And if I had tried to have a relationship with my mother, who was the world-class narcissist abuser, all of those things that are on the list, I would never have had a moment of sanity. The second question, you said when we are in the pain of withdrawal to ask ourselves what step relates to this now. Why do we ask that? And how does it lessen my pain? <laughs> so the context that I was speaking about that in is that in recovery, we're constantly solution focused. In our disease, we're constantly focused on the guy or the girl or the family member or the coworker who's doing us wrong, the qualifier of some sorts that's disturbing our sanity and serenity. So to get us back into the solution is being able to say, okay, what step is this is going to help you the most? And I gave the example of when I was spinning out in Rome uh, regarding the gentleman that I was dating who wasn't calling me at the times we had set aside. And my sponsor immediately said, go back to step one and go to no contact. So the step that that related to was, okay, I'm powerless over this man. And my life in Rome on vacation with my son is now unmanageable if I don't go back to that step and go no contact. So sometimes what that conversation looks like, like what step does this relate to? It can be step five and six, I mean, six and seven, even though you might not be on specifically step six and seven, but it certainly doesn't hurt to be able to look at, okay, this is my character defect and looking to other people being in the room with all the receptors receptacles around me and I'm the plug trying to plug into anybody who give me love, attention, validation, and approval. That's my character defect that I get to go to my higher power with. My external quest for lava gets to become my internal gift of love, attention, validation, and approval. When I begin to know how to give it to myself and when I can begin to get it from each of you, like we give each other healthy love, attention, validation, and approval and our higher power, the more we connect with our higher power. And, you know, there's frequently things that come up that we need to own our responsibility for. And that's what step two or step 10 inventory is all about. 
Like my step 10 inventory is where I get to look over my day and say, you know, where am I responsible for this? So those are just a few examples of how you would apply the steps, because if we're not applying the steps, we're trying to be a support group or a self-help group and, and we're not self-help or su- support. We do support each other, but it's all based around the 12 steps of SLAA. So the third question on our chat today is what is a qualifier? What is your take on that idea? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that question, because it is one of those things that really is unique to SLAA. If you were in AA, the qualifier would be the alcohol is basically the equivalent. Like they say that our drug has legs <laughs> and, and that's just it. So we turn to people and we turn to people typically to get the love, attention, validation, and approval, I abbreviate it as LAVA, that we weren't given as children, as that we weren't given by those who needed to authentically be giving it to us. And so we're on this eternal quest to find that. And so people who we go to for that, they're not all qualifiers, but people we go to for that who are then not good people, they don't have our best interest in mind. They are cheaters, liars, abusers, users, losers, and confusers. And so we want love to look like love. We want love to feel like love. We want love to sound like love. So a lot of that abuse and that vagueness and that saying, I'll be here and I'll do this. And then they don't say they're not there and they don't do it. And, you know, uh, they're in jail, they're still addicted to all kinds of things. Those are people we don't belong in relationship with. Because when I love myself, like my higher power loves me, I want to be with people who can love me in that authentic way. You know, when you love yourself, like your higher power loves you, you gravitate towards people who are good for you. So qualifiers are people who bring out the worst in us. Two days before I got married, I put my fist through a wall. (laughs) I was so mad at my soon to be husband. Had no business marrying that person, but I was so highly sex addicted to him. It was unbelievable. And I'm very happy to say to all of you, I've never had that kind of experience before. And I'm glad that in a certain way I had that because it got me here with you, you know, like the intensity, it took the intensity of that to get even SLAA on my radar. And even though I didn't stay when he and I were married, I eventually came back when I could see it was with a different situation, but I could see that I was still in the throes of that. So- Question four is, if I'm in a healthy relationship with a great guy, why do I keep noticing other men and wondering if he would be a better choice? I have dated great men, but I am always looking at other men and longing to fall madly head over heels in love. Why? Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's one of those situations that no one else can answer for you. But having been in that situation too, um, it's like that, you know, cheaters, liars, users, abusers, losers and confusers like confusers are the ones that get us all the most confusing because there's so much that's good about them but yet there's still something that's not quite right and it keeps us in this limbo and so frequently we have to be equally as weary or worry of dating the confuser as we do the cheater and the liar etc and so Um, this is what makes SLAA such an interesting and fascinating program, because if we looked around our room right now, what brings us here are the people who are just dyed in the wool love addicts, the people who are dyed in the wool sex addicts, the ones who just have cheated on every single 
person they've ever been with. The people who pornography is like the first thing they go to. The people who masturbation is the first thing. So we all have a different pattern. And then that's part of the importance of the first part of our recovery is to find our pattern. And so I think looking at, you know, what your pattern has been, if that's always been your pattern is being able to see, yeah, there's not a person who's going to be the be all end all. And where are the glitches in the relationship that might be the ones that are, you know, having you look outside of the relationship. And it doesn't mean that just because those glitches are there, we're all human. And as far as I know, no one has met the perfect partner. Is there anyone here who's met the perfect partner? <laughs> as far as I know, there, thank you. There is no perfect partner. And so we are looking for the perfect partner though. You know, one of our characteristics says that we assign magical qualities. So while I was busy signing magical qualities, I was also busy assigning like villainous qualities. Like, you know, if they just don't do one little thing right, I'm my, my diseased self was looking for the perfect person. So one little thing they do wrong, and then I'm off and running to break up and go on to the next person. And so I'm grateful that I don't do that today. And so I think that's the journey of really looking is like, is there, even though this person is all those amazing things, are there things about that person that don't make them right for you? And you'll only know that by continuing to come to the meetings, or is that just your eternal, uh, eternal quest for more and different and bigger and better lava? from somebody else, like maybe somebody else can give it to you better or it'll hit the nail. It's like when you're in the refrigerator and you're looking for, oh, what's going to really hit the spot now? Oh, it's not that. It's not that. Oh, maybe it's this. No, you know, like we're looking for something and it's really the only thing that's going to do it is God. Thank the only thing that's that. going to do it is our relationship with our higher power. So I hope you'll keep coming back. I'm extending to you a global hug. <laughs> Thank you. Question five is this. We talk to other members on outreach who are suffering badly in withdrawal, and we know they would feel a lot better if they went no contact with their qualifier, but they just cannot do it. How do we support them to find willingness to go no contact? What should we say? Yeah, that's a great question because we all, if we're doing outreach calls, we're going to be in this situation. And so I just acknowledge everyone who makes and takes outreach calls. Recovery would not exist if we don't take and make outreach calls. And so um, when we're dealing with somebody who's in the thick of it, and we know that it would all change if they would have the self-esteem, like you have to have a certain amount of self-esteem to go no contact. Like you have to know that you deserve better and we all deserve better than the insanity and the madness of our sex and love addiction. But we have to get it up high enough to, to have people like us say to that person, I believe in you and I believe in your ability to find this or something way better. Like crumbs, like you're just taking crumbs. And sometimes it's worse than crumbs. Recently, um, uh, someone shared that they were accepting phone calls from the guy in prison. Now let's see, cheater, liar, abuser, user, loser, confuser, and prison. <laughs> like you, we deserve better. So I think it's being able to say to a newcomer and somebody who's in, this, in the throes of that is like, I want you to believe in yourself as much as I believe in your ability to have a better life. And like you have the ability to have a better life. So that's one aspect of your question that's really important. Now I wanna share the other aspect of this question that's in between the lines. If you're, uh, new in your recovery and sometimes even have years in recovery. Sometimes someone is deeper in their disease than we are in our recovery. 
Have you ever felt it? Like you're in the middle of the swimming pool in the deep end and that person is drowning and they're just grabbing at you and grabbing at you and you're sinking with them because they're so deep in their disease. Everything you say, they have a yeah, but, yeah, but. Well, what about? And so what I like to say is if I'm getting off of calls and I'm feeling like, that was futile. Like, what was that? Like what truck just hit me? (laughs) Then I'm possibly talking too long. Like um, outreach calls don't need to be more than what we call a five and five. Like you share five minutes, I share five minutes. And if we want feedback, we can do three minute feedback. Sometimes they can go longer, but if they're constantly going longer, what happens to people is that these are exhausting. I don't have an hour to spend on the phone. And so people stop taking calls because they think they have to be an hour. So it's perfectly okay for us to learn how to set boundaries and say, I have five minutes um, or I have 10 minutes, I have 15 minutes and then keep the boundary. You like have to interrupt <laughs> like, Hey, so sorry to interrupt. I've got to jump on another call here. Or I've got other things I need to finish before the end of this day. And so um, that being able to recognize when someone is further in their disease than you are in your recovery, that sometimes um, those calls really need to be very short because we are not doing anyone any service to listen to the he did this and the she did that. And that's not solution oriented. So the next question is, what is sober dating? (laughs) Sober dating in a nutshell is when your, the, the, the love addiction and the sex addiction. So the mental and emotional and the physical aspects of your disease are arrested and that gets arrested by working the steps. And so there's all different kinds of like theories. I know in the Los Angeles area, once you've finished your fifth step, you're clear for sober dating. And just my humble opinion that's worth about a half of a half of a half of a penny. (laughs) And that's, I just can't imagine sober dating without having all 12 of those steps. Like really what I bring to the dating experience, if I haven't looked at my character defects in step six and seven, If I haven't made amends, like you bring something super special to all your relationships after you've made amends. Like that's one of the most humbling experiences ever. So again, this is only my opinion. And that is that we have one year off of dating, one year of meeting ourselves, one year of getting to know who are you? What are your values? What are my values? I didn't know. You know, my flagship qualifier was a big boater. And I remember boating with him and going over to Catalina Island and it was all glamorous and him asking me, so do you like this kind of lifestyle of boating? And I said, yeah, what is there not to like? Well, I didn't know at that time that what's way more important to me than boating from um, Newport Beach, California, 26 miles to Catalina, is for me to get on a plane and to fly and see you in London and you in Ireland. Like all the money he had was put into the boat. So we weren't going anywhere. But I didn't know myself well enough at that time to be able to say, yeah, I do. I like boating a lot. This is really fun. And I like global travel. Like I want to see the world. Would that still be a part of our lives if we were together? But I didn't have the confidence to say that. I was in a desperate quest for lava and he was giving plenty of that, uh, albeit, um, what is that word? Uh, What's the money? Counterfeit. Albeit counterfeit lava, you know, it just looked good. It wasn't like real love, attention, validation, or approval. It was all based on sex and um, his sex addiction too. 
So that year is beautiful. Like date yourself, get to know yourself, figure out your meditation, your conscious contact with your higher power and who you are. And so then you sober date. And one more story that I've sponsored women who maybe have had six months or so and, you know, somebody, they meet somebody in the grocery store, or, you know, their kids introduce them to somebody and they say, okay, you know, here's a great prospect. And I really want to sober date him. Well, you're not ready for sober dating. Yeah. But I really want you to help me sober date him. I can't help somebody sober date who hasn't taken the time to become an intentionally autonomous woman and to work the steps and to like write the dating plan. No. This is not where, oh, you met somebody on Friday night. Let's do a crash course and write your dating plan so you can go out on Saturday night. No. Sorry. <laughs> and so um, sober dating. Did I miss anything? Did no, I miss anything, I, ladies? I think that sober was dating. Okay. Now, now here's, a, here's another aspect we do need to talk about. Okay. You've been cleared for sober dating. And like I shared, I got ridiculously triggered in Rome. And so sober dating doesn't mean it's all going to go perfect from there. Like people act like, oh, I'm cleared for sober dating. It's all going to be smooth sailing now. Let me guarantee you, it's not going to be smooth sailing. Like it's going to bring out everything about your disease and it's going to be tough, you know, but we stick together. Like we're in this together and there's no black and whites to it. Like I have, you know, nine years and a few months of perfectly imperfect sobriety. You know, my bottom lines are number one, like I don't do the he's the one syndrome. Like that was the hallmark of my disease was, you know, I fell in love in Trader Joe's on the cereal aisle when the guy turned to me and smiled. And then we saw each other again on the frozen food aisle. And I asked him if he'd ever tried this, you know, blue corn enchilada and he talked to me. And then by the time we got over to the produce, I was in full blown love. So when he left that day and didn't ask for my number, and I watched him leave in his Porsche Carrera, <laughs> um, I literally sat at the stop sign and tears came down my cheeks because I couldn't believe that he was going to leave. And so my my primary quality is um, characteristic is that I don't do the, he's the one syndrome. I don't put any of my eggs. I don't care how many dates I've had. I just don't. So that's my number one bottom line. And so the second one is that I don't get intimate with anyone that I'm not in a committed monogamous exclusive relationship. And we've talked about it. Like, here's what a committed monogamous and exclusive relationship looks like to me. You know, like you and I are in a relationship, you're not seeing anybody else. And I'm not, you're not just sleeping with me while you date other people. Like you're committed to me. And this is not just for the summer while you're visiting, you know, or while this is not just for a few weeks while you're visiting Bali. And I happen to be there. <laughs> because this is going to come up. So I had to throw that in. This is like, we're both open and available, available for a long-term committed and monogamous relationship. And we're talking about this. There's no assumptions here. Nobody's assuming anybody's not seeing anybody. And so, um, so I don't have sex outside of a committed monogamous and exclusive long-term, potentially long-term relationship. And here comes the big one. Write this down. Nothing comes unbuckled, unbelted, unzipped, unhooked, or unsnapped for 30 days, 10 dates, or more. Now, this is unique to me. So this isn't, and, and let's preface here that everything you're hearing today is 
my opinion, not SLAA as a whole. But the reason that that is so important, that nothing comes unbuckled, unbelted, unzipped, unhooked, or unsnapped for 30 days and 10 dates or more is that I'm a sex addict. And maybe that's, you know, I don't have a long history of promiscuity, but I certainly have a history of getting uh, deep into a sexual relationship and missing how much I don't have in common. Like my flagship qualifier and I had nothing in common outside of the bedroom. And so I couldn't see that then. So the reason that nothing comes unbuckled, unbelted, unzipped, unhooked, or unsnapped is that I'm not going to sexualize myself. Like I didn't know how not to be sexualized. I am a grateful recovering incest survivor as well. And I had the opportunity to confront my perpetrators. And so I've had tremendous healing around my sensuality and sexuality. And I'm grateful for that. I have a very healthy and um, fun sex life when I'm involved with a committed partner. And so that nothing coming unbuckled, unbelted, unzipped, or hooked, unsnapped means that we're going to kiss and we're going to hold hands but you're not, I'm not going to be sexualized and I'm not going to sexualize them because once those conversations around sensuality and sexuality begin, the focus comes off of who we are as people and goes on to who we are as sexual partners. And so that is really very, very important in sober dating is that we learn how to be, you know, in a relationship without sexualizing ourselves so our last question is how do you know someone is a qualifier when they have helped tremendously through the years and now the worst in you comes out in your relationship with them are they a qualifier or is it me you know if that person is a qualifier right right um i think that to, to me and i welcome anyone else to input this is that there's an aspect of a qualifier that brings out the worst in me that that i'm not able to maintain my conscious contact with my higher power and just a peaceful life like i've got to let all of you know that once we have multiple years of sobriety what happens is there's a serenity in my life that i want to keep i'm not willing to sacrifice this serenity for just anyone or anything like I, I value what I have developed because of recovery and meditation and working the steps. Like it's priceless. So there's elements of a qualifier that disturb our serenity. It could be their unpredictability. It could be the way they put us down. It could be maybe they're really, really helpful, but maybe at the same time they're giving, you know, kind of backhanded compliments or something. So the, the, the inequity the inequality of it isn't worth it any longer. Maybe the good part that they bring comes with this whole negative part. And so that's how we can tell, like if this is a qualifier, I can't keep my emotional equilibrium and emotional equilibrium is really important. Like one of the biggest and most beautiful gifts of the program is the release of the release of obsession. Like my mind is my own today. I didn't own my mind. So wherever you go, you take yourself with you. And I remember being on a double-decker bus, just like in London, but I was in Philadelphia with my son. Kenny was 12 years old at that time. I was on a business trip and he flew out to meet me. Here's my darling 12-year-old son. This was minutes before I got into SLAA because it was with that particular, I call him my butt-in-the-seat qualifier. And I'm riding around beautiful Philadelphia. You know, there's the steps that Rocky and Sylvester Stallone ran up and Kenny and I ran up those stairs and, you know, posed for a picture. But my mind was not with my son. My mind was not in Philadelphia. I was sitting on that bus obsessed with the Calgary guy. And the beautiful, one of the many beautiful things about our program is that we own our minds. Like my mind space is now mine. I'm not obsessed about any of the men that I have dated in the past or potential um, partners or how it ended and what went on and will I get him back? And does he still want me? And let me go check out his, you know, Facebook page and all that kind of stuff. So 
um, qualifiers add a, a negativity to our lives. And so we're the ones who ultimately have to decide uh, who somebody, if somebody is a qualifier or not. And um, yeah, I think that's a good place to end because you know I could go on and on and on, <laughs> but I'll refrain. <laughs> and I want to say one more thing. Um, thank you, Mira. I am honoring your, you know, ability to just step into this space and lead such a beautiful, beautiful meeting. And all of the women who have really been present today, this topic, our, our recovery depends on this topic because no contact is sobriety. And it's usually the beginning, the first steps of sobriety is to have that no contact. So it's been an honor to really be here with all of you women and to just be on this journey journey with you. Like, I believe in you. I believe that whatever gifts of the miracles that have been given to me in the program, I believe that they are true for every single one of you and those women who are listening to the recording today. So thank you for giving me this honor and over and out. <laughs>